we're glad that you're with us this morning. If your Bibles turn to Galatians chapter 3. How many people were here last week? If you weren't, shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you can go online and listen to that. I'm, di- I'm just going to pick up because I didn't, wasn't able to finish last week. Um, and so we're going we're to pick up. But I do want to do a little bit of review. You know, while you're turning there, just to remind you of this scripture because we're talking about our position in him. And this is uh, probably going to be our last message in the series. And uh, starting on the 21st, I'm going to be starting a series called Righteousness. It's who I am. And uh, so we're going to talk about righteousness uh, starting on the 21st. And so, uh, but this morning, I want to finish up with our position in him. Before I read Galatians, I'm going to read John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, listen, that? But as many as received him, he gave them the power. Now, that word power means Right. You could say gave them the ability, gave them the grace to, gave them the strength to, gave them the power. Whatever it is, it comes down to the fact that you and I are sons and daughters of God because we believe on his name, right? It says it's not just to them, but it's to all those that would believe on his name. And it said this doesn't come by the will of the flesh. It didn't come by the will of man. It didn't come by blood, but it came by a promise. It came by the, the fact that it was God's will that you and I would be part of his family. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I mean, that's something we need to praise God, that I am in his family. I'm a part of his family. I don't, I'm not trying to get into his family. I am part of his family because I made him Lord and I believed on his name. Amen? amen. Now, over here in Galatians, actually, before I read Galatians 3, let me do four real quick. Verse 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So I'm no longer a servant, but I'm a son. Say a son. son. And then it says, If I'm a son, then I'm heir of God through Christ Jesus. So in Christ Jesus, I'm now able to be an heir. I now have rights to something. Amen? Amen. Amen? You ever go online and try to find, you know, maybe some lost hair inheritance that might be to you? Do you ever click your name and try to find any money that might be owed to you, right? You know, it's like you want to know, if there's something out there, I, I want it. If there's something, I, I, it's, it's mine. So, so realize that as being sons of God, we are heirs to something. We have access. We have rights to something. Amen. And that's why I'm so looking forward to getting in this series on righteousness, man, because it's just going to open up our mind so much more to what we have access to. But over here in Galatians 3, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now let's go to Galatians 3, 29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Say promise. Promise. So get this. In these two scriptures, we see two things that as I'm in Christ, I'm a partaker of a promise and I'm a partaker of a blessing, right? And listen, I'm just going to take a short time to review. Last week, we talked about the blessing and the power of the blessing. And we, we related to the word blessing as you could say grace, you could say power, you could say strength, you could say anointing, you could say spirit. Whatever it is, when God says the blessing, and he says his blessing, he's talking about all those things. So we first see the blessing in the very beginning with Adam, right? And what did he bless them? And it said he gave them dominion and authority to do what? To replenish the earth, to take authority over the earth, to expand the earth. But yet, what did we see? We just saw them in the garden, not fulfilling their purpose. You see, they were just confined to the garden when God had called them to reap. They had the blessing on their life, not just so they could sit back and do nothing in in a place of pleasure. No, he put the blessing on them in order for them to advance his kingdom in the earth. And that's what we're dealing with, continue to deal with this morning, taking ground and advancing the kingdom of God, right? Right? And we saw this, the blessing is the empowerment, the grace, the strength, and the ability to take ground. The ground that God's already established that's ours. We see that same blessing in in Genesis chapter 13 with Abraham. And he told him after he left Canaan and he left Lot, he said, look around everywhere you see. Everywhere you see is your ground. 
Everywhere you place your foot, it's your ground, and it's going to be beyond what you can number. And so he went from Canaan, a place of humility, to a place of memory, which is a place of abundance, because he understood the blessing. So we have to understand the power of the blessing, because when I'm in Christ, I'm a partaker of the blessing. The same blessing that was on Abraham, that same blessing is on you and me and is giving us access to take ground, to take territory, and to possess whatever God's promised is ours. Amen. Let's go to Joshua chapter 14. I don't know if I did a good enough job reviewing or not, but you can go on and I don't want to spend too much time on that. We're talking about taking territory and advancing the kingdom of God. Let me make the statement before I read this. In the Old Testament, the blessing brought increase and empowerment, and it brought them victories. How much more in the New Testament with a new covenant established upon better promises? Think about that. In the Old Testament, the blessing was for that. How much more in a new covenant, right? Now, here in, in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Then the people of Judah came to Joshua of Gilgal, I'm going to read read in the King James. Verse 7 says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. Remember the story of Joshua and Caleb and they sent the spies out to to the promised land and they came back and 10 came with a negative report and two came back with a positive positive report. Who was that? Joshua and Caleb. So he's remembering. Remember that time? He goes, I went and I said what was in my heart to do, but you know what? Everyone else, they didn't understand. They came back and everyone else's hearts melted. Meaning what, what what they said controlled everyone else. And verse, verse 8 says, Nevertheless, my brethren went up and made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord. That's about position. He, I was positioned in the Lord. Verse 9, And Moses swore on the day, saying, Surely the land where I'm put your feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly, wholly followed the Lord thy God. There we see it again. He wholly followed the Lord. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, As he said these 45 years. Now how old was Joshua and Caleb when he first said this? Does anyone know? 40. So now we see it was 45 years ago that Moses said this. 45 years since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now lo, I am this day fourscore in five years. 85 years old. Now get this, verse 11. As yet... I am as strong this day as I was the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now think about this. Here Caleb is declaring something, but what we've got to understand, and it's been kind of like a theme this morning, with, with yes and amen, the song, it promises. See, this was promises. They, these were promises that were given. You know, what Annette read, those were about promises, you know, give, and it will be, that, those are promises. And here, Caleb is holding on to these promises for 45 years. How long will you hold on to a promise for? How long will you hold on to the promise of God? And yet, he declared, he said, I'm just as strong now than the day that I left Egypt. See, you have to understand, when they left Egypt, they left with the blessing on them. Not with a blessing, but they left with the blessing. You see, when you understand the blessing, then you understand a blessings just come with the blessing. The blessing was on them. It said there was not one feeble among a, uh, not one feeble one among them. It said their eyesight wasn't abated. Everything they had strength, and and the thing is, is Caleb is still walking in that same strength forty five years later, because he understood the blessing. And he understood what it meant to be positioned with God. He wholly, many, many, as long as I stay in this position, I stay in the blessing. As I stay in this position, I'm staying in the position where I have strength for anything. Where I'm equal to anything and I can overcome anything or any obstacle. The blessing. 
Let me read verse 11 again. As yet I am strong as this day as I was the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain. See, he knew what was his. He knew what his, he goes, he goes, the moment before we even went on that journey, Moses already told us what land was ours. You know what? And I've been waiting 45 years for this land and behold, give me this mountain. But let me give you some insight. This wasn't about one mountain. If you look at other translations, this was the whole valley and the whole area of Hebron. It wasn't just one mountain. It was a whole region. About 726 square miles. And he said, give me, give me what's mine. And, the, and if you keep reading, it goes on. It talks about, well, you know what? There's still giants there. He, and so J, he, he's like, God was with me then. He's with me now. In the same way I would have defeated the giants 45 years ago, I'm just as strong now for war to go out and to go in. So, so Caleb goes in and it takes the land. And now listen to this. It said it changed the land from Kiriath Arba to Hebron. Who was, what is Kiriath Arba? It means King Arba. Who was Arba? He was the strongest Philistine. He was the strongest of the Anakins, of the giants. He was the strongest. And so the whole land was named after one man. Caleb goes in and takes it and he calls it Hebron. What does Hebron mean? Association. What does that mean? So it used to be about one man. Now Caleb makes it about his association with God. You see, it was his association with God that caused him to go in and take territory. It was his association with God that caused him to operate and walk in the blessing. See, we are positioned in Christ. How much more? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Last week we talked about being in Christ. And we talked about I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Our position is in Christ. I'm not, I'm not positioning myself in the blessing. See, that, then it makes it about you. Yes. I'm not positioning myself in grace. I'm not positioning myself in strength. I'm positioning myself in Him. Because when I position myself in Christ, I position myself in the blessing. In grace. In peace. In strength. In the anointing. In the Holy Spirit. Right? Right? It's in Christ. Everything that we do is in Christ. Let's look at verse 19 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who has been preached among you by us, by myself, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it is always the divine yes. For as many as are the promises of God. What was Caleb holding on to? A promise of God. Right? Right? He was holding on to a promise. For as many as are the promises of God, they all find their yes and answer in Christ, in Him. For this reason, we also utter the amen, so be it, to God through Him, in His person and by His agency, to the glory of God. But it is God who confirms and makes us steadfast and establishes us. Now get, the, get, that, get that real quick. It is God who establishes us. It is God who confirms and makes us steadfast and establishes us. Meaning that when we're in Christ, He makes us steady. He sets us in the right position. It is in Christ we're established. In joint fellowship with you in Christ. And has consecrated and anointed us. So get this, when you are in Christ, you're established and you're anointed. That's what this scripture says. It says that Christ... God, who confirms his word, it says that he's established us and anointed us. The one that's established us and anointed us is God. Hallelujah. In doing us, amplifies it, in doing us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
He has also appropriated and acknowledged us by his, by acknowledged us as his by putting his seal upon us and giving us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a security deposit and a guarantee of the fulfillment of his promise. But I call upon God as my sole witness. It was to avoid hurting you that I refrain from coming to Corinth. Now that we have dominion over you and lorded over your faith, but rather that we work with you as fellow laborers to promote your joy. For in your faith, in your strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. See, it's in Christ we're established. It's in Christ that we're anointed. And then it says, it's in Christ that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Don't try to live your life outside of Christ. We are Christians. Our, our life isn't based on just ascribing to some sort of just religion. No, our identity is solely placed in Christ. Because it says that when I'm in Christ, Justin, I'm established. You know what? If I get outside of Christ, then hey, I, I'm going to be shaken. See, it, it's in Christ that I'm anointed. Outside of Justin, Justin can't do nothing. It's in Christ that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. And see, I'm just building on something. I want you to see something because you have to understand that your revelation of Christ has to go beyond your head knowledge. It has to go beyond just your religious duty that you do on a Sunday morning. It has to become a part of your life where it changes every area of your life. If your life hasn't changed in the last year, it's not God's fault. If you're in the same place that you've been for the last 20 years, it, it's not God's fault. It's because we're out of position. Because if we're positioned in Christ, then I'm, position, I'm established, I'm anointed, and I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why is it so important for us to take this position? Not only because we can walk through any situation, and that's what we dealt with last week, but, but you have to understand also, it is what causes us to overcome any obstacle. Let's look over in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph. Yeah, but thanks be to God who, in Christ Jesus, always, 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 always leads me, always directs me. He, he's always wanting to direct you in a path that's good. He always wants to lead you in a path that's going to get right results. In Christ, he always leads me in triumph. Go to, hold your place there and go, let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 1 says, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. Then you're born of God, right? Yes. Let's look at verse 4. For whatsoever, over, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now, do you see that? Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Then verse 4 says, for whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. See, when I understand and believe that he's the Son of God, I've just positioned myself that I'm a Son of God. And I've just positioned myself that I live in a place, in a way that I can be victorious over anything this world throws at me. Any situation that I encounter in this world, I have the ability, I have the right, and I'm gifted in grace and blessed to overcome it. Because it's in Christ. The blessing is on me. See, when I received Jesus, the same blessing that was on Abraham came upon my life. And I'm heirs according to the promise. The same blessing that was on Caleb's life to cause him to go out and to cause him to come in. That same blessing is on my life. And it is a blessing that will cause me to win. 
is a blessing that will cause me to win. You might say, well, pastor, do you always win? I never quit. I never quit. Do you ever get bad, bad reports? Yes. Had several, I've gotten several bad reports over the years. But I don't quit. And if I don't quit, I know I win. Well, 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 well what, if, what if you die? I won. Well, what if, what if, he, what if the enemy takes... I win. I, Paul, Paul said it's far greater to depart. He said to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, I won. So there's no quit in me and there needs to be no quit in you when you understand the blessing is on your life. You are in Christ to win and you win for eternity. It said he took away the sting of death. In, in, uh, in Corinthians chapter 5, he took away the sting of death. Meaning you don't feel it. You just transition from one body to another. To a, to a, you transfer. It's like, it's like all of a sudden, if, you know, beam me up, Scotty. And you, you went from Texas to Maryland. That's what going to heaven is all about. You don't even feel it. You don't say he took away the sting of death. What's the sting of death? The fact that you would be forever separated from God. But when I'm positioned in Christ, the blessing's on me, grace is on me, strength is on me, the Holy Ghost is on me, and I'm empowered and quit for anything because what? I'm in Christ, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You are victorious. You are not a quitter. You are going to make it. I declare that your marriage will get stronger. I declare that your finances will get stronger. I prophesy that your body will get healed. I prophesy that you will be stronger, stronger this time next year than you are today. I declare that you have more revelation next year than this time today. I declare that you grow more and more in every area of your life. I declare that you operate and grow in the gifts that God's placed on the inside of you, inside the church and outside the church. Because the blessing's on you. Stop looking at it as the blessing as a means for you to get rich. If that's all you look at as the blessing as, then you are shortchanging God. Because any material in these things in this world is wood, hay, and stubble in God's eyes. Yeah, we've given the right to the blessing to prosper. But realize that to prosper is all about taking ground and advancing the kingdom of God. That's why we're positioning Christ to take ground and advance his kingdom. He always causes me to triumph. He always causes me to triumph. Thank you, Father. You know, in, in chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, it talks about, it says, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be epistles of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of, of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Meaning, I, I, my trust to God, because I'm sufficient. I can only be enough when I'm positioned in Christ. Stop trying to do life on your own. It's in Christ. In Acts chapter 17, Paul says, it's in him. It's in him I live and move and have my being. Don't do it without Christ. Don't do it without Christ. This whole, whole gospel that we preach, this whole gospel that we believe in is all about Christ. And God's plan from the very beginning with Adam and Eve was to multiply his kingdom throughout the earth. Without going back there, I just want to bring this out. With Caleb, when he went into the land and changed it to Hebron, to a place where he associated with God, it said there was rest throughout the land. It was said there was no more war and there was rest. You see, when you understand the blessing is on your life, it changes your environment. 
The blessing that was on Caleb's life changed the atmosphere around him. And you have to understand that we're all atmosphere changers, either good or bad. It doesn't matter what field you work in, what gifting that might be on your life, you, you are called to change the atmosphere. And whatever the atmosphere is to bring a godly awareness and bring peace into that atmosphere. Right. And that's what Caleb did. It said there was, there was no more war and there was rest over all the land. Why? Because of the blessing that was on him. Let's look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 again. So the blessing on my life caused me to walk through any situation... The blessing on my life causes me to be victorious over any situation. Now, the blessing on my life is that it causes me to influence the world around me. Now, look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory and... Okay, so and, he, I mean, there's part two here. So... The, that this Christ always leads me in triumph and through us spreads and make evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ which exhales unto God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the latter it's an aroma from death to death a fatal odor, the smell of doom. To the former, it's an aroma from life to life, a vital fragrance, living and fresh. And who is qualified, fit and sufficient for these things? Who is able for such a ministry? We? Now get this. He says, in Christ, I, he always calls me to triumph. And through us, spreads and makes evidence the fragrance of God everywhere. Now, now get a picture of this. You see, when I'm in Christ and I'm positioned in Christ, everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. Everywhere. In, when I'm in Christ, the blessing is on me, grace is on me, the anointing is on me, the Holy Ghost is on me. Everywhere I go, I got the Holy Ghost for breeze and I'm making the knowledge of God everywhere. You see, and it says to some, it, it's, it's a fragrance from death to death. And for some, it's from life to life. Let me, let me read this in the, in the message. You see, you, you, the anointing, the grace, and the peace is... I'm sorry if that, hurts you, if that smell <laughs> bothers you or I sprayed too much. You see, there's some rooms you walk in that don't smell that good. And there's some rooms that you walk in and smell really good. And, and I'll leave it there. And... Uh, <laughs> I will not expound on that thought, but, because my wife is looking at me funny, so, uh, <laughs> now, now listen to this, in the Messiah, in Christ, God leads us from place to place, now get this, in one perpetual victory parade, through us, he brings knowledge of Christ, everywhere we go, people breathing in the exquisite fragrance, because of Christ, we give off a sweet scent rising to God, which is recognized by those on their way of salvation and aroma redolent with life. But those on the way to destruction treat us more like the stench from a rotten corpse. You see, we're coming to a place in our society where you know who Christians are and you know who Christians aren't. And, there, and, there, and the thing is, is the world will never like your smell. Now, the thing is, is we need to smell good so, so they can desire. Wait a minute, maybe there's something different about their life. Maybe there's something more about... See, see, when you start, when you're living like the rest of the world, you're giving off the scent that the rest of the world has. And what happens when you're giving off the rest of the scent of the rest of the world has, the thing is you blend in and you don't change things. So you don't need to smell like the rest of the world. You need to smell like Jesus. You need to be full of grace and full of peace. See, when you step into your workplace, there needs to be something different about you. People need to say, there's something just different about you, Vic. 
there's just something different about you, Eric. There's just something different. There's just something different about you. And we're, and we're, what is different about you? What they're getting, they're getting the fragrance. They're getting a fra- They don't know what they're getting. They're not sure what it is. There's just a fragrance. They're like, I like the smell of that. What, what cologne are you wearing? Oh, man, that's some good stuff, George. What is that you wear? Oh, it's Christ. It's Christ, and it, it, it's, my, it's my, I don't have my Mr. Burberry on right now. I got my Mr. Christ on, and, and you know, and, and my Mr. Christ makes me smell good. But it's when you take your position in him, it causes the, the world to change around you. So that's why we have to make sure we're like Christ and not like the world. Because there is a definitely difference. Definite difference. Don't confuse the two. Because the world will never change by you trying to be like the world. It won't. Never happen. See, when Jesus... See, it wasn't until the Holy Ghost came on Jesus' life that he started influencing. You see, when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and it descended like a dove and a voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased... The next thing we know, he, he goes into the wilderness and he comes out and he stands up in the reed and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus grew up in the temple. We see that time and time again, how he grew up in the temple at a young age, but there was something different about this day. There was something different because now he knows who he is and what's on his life. Now when he stood in the reed, now he recognized, I am God's beloved son and I am anointed. So when he stood, there was a boldness. See, when you know who you are and what's on your life, it will give you a boldness. So when you know that you're a son of God and you know the blessings on your life, it gives you a boldness to walk through any situation, a boldness to stand for victory, a boldness to understand that you're called to influence the world around you. And, and, and it's not about I'm better than you. It's, with, with the world, it's not about telling the world you're better than them. No, it's just, it just makes them want to know what's different about you. What's different about you? We see this even with the, with the disciples in Acts chapter 4. After Jesus had already been crucified and, and at the gate, beautiful, they, they had just healed a man that had been, been there for, for a majority of his life. And they come out and they have all these questions. And, and Peter's talking about this boldness that he, he preached in. And, and all of a sudden, the, 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 even the magistrates that are standing there, they're like, they're like, man, we don't know what to do. And, you know, we, we can't do this because then it's going to cause a uproar because we can't deny the miracle. And, and they're saying, you know what, we're not sure they're unlearned, ignorant men, but we can tell they've been with Jesus. We can tell they've been with Jesus. Can people tell that you've been with Jesus? Can people tell that you've been taking your position? So when you're in Christ, not only does it lead you to, 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 to have victory, but it also spreads through you the fragrance and the knowledge of God everywhere. Go to Colossians 1, and I'll close with this. Colossians 1. Our position in Christ. Repeat this after me. Today, Today I'm, positioned I'm positioned in Christ. In Christ. It's where I, it's where I belong. In Christ, in Christ I, walk I walk through any situation. In Christ, in Christ I'm, victorious I'm victorious over every situation. Over every situation. And in Christ, in Christ, I influence the world. I influence the world. Hallelujah. Verse 24, Colossians 1, verse 24. It says, even now I rejoice in the midst of my sufferings on your behalf. And in my own person, I'm making up whatever's still lacking and remains to be completed on our part of Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now listen, this, in it, I became a minister in accordance with the divine stewardship, what was entrusted to me for you. Meaning, I became a minister so I could impact your life. 
as its object and for the benefit to make the word of God fully known. Meaning why I'm in this? Because I want you to know what I know and I want you to fully know God. I want you to fully know God like I know God. Verse 26 says, the mystery. Now he's going to tell us what we need to fully know. The mystery which was hidden for ages and generations, but is now revealed to his holy people, the saints. You see, this was a mystery, and people didn't understand it. People didn't understand the Jewish people. They didn't understand how how they could live blessed in times that were cursed. How a man like Joseph could go and be the second in charge in Egypt. And be over all the resources of Egypt. And people couldn't understand these things. And they didn't understand. That's why throughout time and throughout the Old Testament. Why why, why different enemies or kings tried to wipe out the Jewish race. Because they didn't understand the mystery. And the mystery comes down to the blessing. They didn't understand the grace. They didn't understand the power. They didn't understand the ability. What's causing them to overcome? How could people the size of grass, grasshoppers overcome people that were giants? You know, how could, how could someone like Elijah meet a widow woman and all of a sudden she starts filling all these pots of oil and the oil doesn't give out? They don't understand that. How could, how could because it was barred, how could the prophet make an axe head float? How You know, how could all of a sudden God put a serpent on a pole and he said, if everyone looks at it, then everyone would be healed. They couldn't understand. These were mysteries for the ages. Hidden for the ages and generations, but is now revealed to his holy people. Verse 7, so what is this mystery? To whom God was pleased to make known how great for the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Wow, man, some deep words here. The riches of the glory of this mystery. Hallelujah. Which is Christ within you and among you, the hope of glory. What is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope in your family. Christ in you is the hope for your neighborhood. Christ in you is the hope of your church. Christ in you is the hope of your workplace. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. It's the Christ in me that gives me an expectation that people will see glory in my life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you got to get this before I, before I close. This isn't a feeling. This isn't a goosebump. This isn't falling down on the ground. This isn't some Pentecostal experience, so to speak. Yes, it can produce those things, and those things can be byproducts, but you have to understand that anything and everything God does has a purpose. So I have to ask the question, because that's the way I think. And when I come to teach, I see scriptures. I'm like, okay, well, why is, why is Christ in me the hope of glory? Is it just so I can... Woo, I got fragrance of Christ going everywhere. Praise the Lord. No, there's a purpose. And then it tells us what this purpose is. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Verse 28, him we preach and proclaim, warning and admonishing everyone and instructing everyone in all wisdom, comprehensive insight in the ways and the purposes of God that we may present every person mature, full grown, fully initiated, complete and perfect in Christ. Now let me just say it this way. There's a lot of words there in the Amplified. But Christ is in you. Why? So that you might present all men perfect in Christ Jesus. Christ is in you, not for you. Christ is in you for someone else. It's that fragrance of knowledge. It's to influence someone else's life. Oh, it affects your life. And I'll I'll say that, keep reading here in a moment. But realize, Christ is in you, the hope of glory, that you might present all men perfect in Christ Jesus. What is it doing? It's reaching out. It's reaching out to someone's hand. Eric, come with me. Christ is in me to reach out to Eric. 
and disciple him. Be a voice in his life for us to lift up one another's hands to talk about what does it mean to surrender to the Lord. What does it mean to, to, to be what God's called us to be? How are, we gonna, how are we going to do what God's placed in our heart, Eric? It's because the anointing in me and the anointing you perfecting each of us. And that's what, that's what Jesus meant when he said and commanded the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Because he didn't say just preach the gospel. He said make disciples. See, the anointing on you is, yes, to preach the gospel to every creature, every nation, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in a mall, whether it's in a store, whether it's at a car wash, whether it's in a group setting, whether it's to masses in Africa, whatever, whatever it is, it's taking the hope that's on the inside of you to bring more completeness to the life that's on the inside of them. So when we're positioning Christ, we can make it through any situation. We can be victorious over any situation. And you will influence the world. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. To whom we preach, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, the King James says, Wherein do I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now get that. It worketh in me, meaning worketh means it's always happening. So the Christ in me, the Christ in me is in me to present all men perfect in Christ Jesus, but also it's to work mightily in me. Amen. Meaning, yeah, it, 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 it strengthens me. Yeah. It increases me. It gives me revelation. It increases my life. It gives me direction. It gives me wisdom. Amen. Christ is in you. It's the hope of glory. Let's take our position. Let's take our position because God has called us to take ground and advance his kingdom. And the only way it will happen is if we position ourselves in Christ. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you for the challenge that it brings. The challenge that this word is birthing on the inside of us. Father, that we would not j just be complacent. We would not just hear these words and, and leave this building unchanged, Father. But we would hear these words and not one word that we heard would fall to the ground, but it would produce in our life. It would give us a passion. It would give us a pursuit. It would give us a desire to go deeper in you. It would give us a desire to understand the reality of my life being in Christ. And anything other than that, I will shortchange my destiny. I will shortchange my future because it's in you that I'm sufficient. It's in you that I'll fulfill all my days. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Everyone stand to your feet. Hallelujah. What would happen... If we all gained a realization of what it means to be in Christ. As a, as a pastor, Net and I uh, can really uh, thank you, Father. Could really just place within you a hunger for. God and your relationship with him and, and see that your relationship with him in the church that he's planted in you is so much more than just doing some sort of duty. You know, as I said last week, I talked about that the reason why Adam and Eve fell was that they became complacent being in the garden instead of fulfilling the purpose. And if anything this morning, I want you to be awakened out of complacency. To realize that, wait a minute, church is a little bit bigger than what I've made it. Church is a little bit more than what the rest of the world is making it. You know, like, well, no, church is, is something that man made. No, it didn't. Jesus founded it and he's the head of it. So don't let the enemy deceive you in thinking that your part in a local body doesn't carry weight. It carries great weight. 
And in reality, what I've learned in my 20, almost 25 years of serving God, that I am where I am because of my place in the local church, not because I'm a pastor now. I, I, I was, it has nothing to do with that. Because I know the church is, is the answer to the world. Because the answer to the world is on the inside of every believer. Christ is in you. Christ is in you. The hope of glory. Man, and Father, expand our thinking to just be able to comprehend that. Because when our, our thinking expands to what that means, man, it opens up impossibilities of what you desire to do through us. And we no longer see ourselves as, well, I'm just this, or I'm just one man, I'm just one lady, I'm just one, no. Twelve men turned the world upside down because they got a revelation that they were in Christ and they were sealed with the Holy Ghost. Father, we receive you and we receive the Holy Ghost to equip us, strengthen us, and empower us for every step of our journey. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You're faithful. You're faithful. Jesus is coming soon. You know, I just for me, I, I mean, just lift your hands with me. If you, if, you, if you have just a hunger to be used by God in greater ways. Use us, Father. That's really your heart's desire. If it's not your heart's desire, don't say it. If it's really your desire, just say, Father, I desire to be used by you. Today, I position myself in Christ. Use me to influence the world around me. Show me, Show me. Place, in my heart. place in my heart what I need to do, need to do. About, my about my role in the local church, in the local church. whether it's this church, whether it's this church. Or, whether it's or whether it's another church. Show me my place, me my place. And, how I and how I am to reach out, to, reach out to, others. to others. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Assist, me. assist me. Give me boldness. Jesus' name. Jesus name. Receive that this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is faithful. Oh, so good. Hallelujah. Mm.